Rabbi Marvin Heyer is the founder, CEO, and president of the Simon Wiesenthal Center and its Museum of Tolerance. The center is known for Holocaust research and remembrance, hunting Nazi war criminals, combating anti-Semitism, tolerance education, and defending Israel. The Museum of Tolerance Jerusalem was founded in 1993 and is now in its final stages of construction due to be completed in 2023. Rabbi Heyer is the visionary who directs the strategic planning for both corporate entities. He has founded Mariah Films, the center's film division, in 1980. Rabbi Heyer is the only rabbi who is a member of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, and is the recipient of two Academy Awards, one in 1997 as co-producer of The Long Way Home, and one in 1981 as co-producer and co-writer for Genocide, a documentary on the Holocaust. Under Heyer's direction, the Wiesenthal Center has served as consultant to Steven Spielberg's epic Schindler's List. His personal relationship with many of Hollywood's leading studio heads has resulted in 40 plus years of national tribute dinners, which have raised hundreds of millions of dollars for the center. Rabbi Heyer was invited to deliver an invocation of a presidential inauguration and the first American to be chosen by the government of Israel to light the, tor the torch of remembrance on Israel's Independence Day. He is also a recipient of two honorary PhDs. What an overachiever you are. <laughs> Newsweek has listed Rabbi Heyer as the number one most influential rabbi in the US. Newsweek also describes Heyer as the following, quote, Heyer is one phone call away from almost every world leader, journalist and Hollywood studio head. Rabbi Heyer is married to Malki and has two sons and eight grandchildren. Welcome to Yentes in the City, Rabbi. It's really an honor to have you here today. Welcome, Rabbi Heyer. <laughs> I feel like we really know your life. We read your book. book. I mean, I've known about you in the community for many years, but I really got an insight more into your life from your book, which was a great read. And I just want to tell you, Etty and I were talking about what an amazing sense of humor you have. And it really was portrayed through the book in numerous occasions. I was, I found myself crying or laughing. <laughs> I want to tell you about by hire. Um, this, we, we did many interviews. This for me was Zgirat <laughs> Magal. I come from a line of, uh, all my family has been in the Israeli Air Force for many, many years. My dad, 27 years. Um, and I found myself crying throughout all this research, both uh, because of the Holocaust, even though you know I do a Zikaron Basalon every year at my house, but to find somebody who could have done anything in his life because you're such an overachiever and to dedicate your life to do this and for you to give us the honor of interviewing you. Uh, it's funny because Shabbat, I was crying on the sofa holding your book. And my daughter came from college, she goes to Berkeley, she came for spring break and she goes, Ima, why are you crying? I go, I'm so excited about this interview. I'm like, I'm so emotional uh, because, and, and I said, you have to read the book and she started reading the book, but I took it from her. <laughs> I think every parent should have the kid read your book, meant to be. So. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. It, it's a pleasure to be here with Hamish hey, Yeden. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, people who love Israel and love Kral Yisrael. Oh, wow. So, Rabbi um, Heyer, before we begin our show, I would like to quote you. In, uh, in your eulogy to Simon Wiesenthal, um, you said, as you go to your eternal repose, I'm sure there is a great staring in heaven as the soul of millions murdered during the Nazi Holocaust. Get ready to welcome Simon Wiesenthal, the man who stood up for the honor and never let the world forget them. Um, I know we know who Simon Wiesenthal. It's so funny because my daughter goes, the Nazi hunter. And I said, he was a lot more than a Nazi hunter. Can you... Um, tell our viewers, in your words, who was Simon Wiesenthal? 
Simon Wiesenthal was a uh, singular individual. There's not a there's not a second one like him. Rabban Shalom created one Simon Wiesenthal. I can tell you about him and I, uh, from many, many personal experiences with him. First of all, I'll never forget when he told me his story about his daughter, that she was a little girl at that time and came home and said to him, Daddy, why don't we have any relatives? Everybody else has mishpacha. And he, as you know, Simon lost 89 members of his family. Mm -hmm. So he didn't want to show tears in front of her, but then he went into the room and cried by himself. And he decided, he said, I have to do this. This is like the Kuach Nefesh. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask a friend to become a relative. And so he went and asked a friend, can you come over to our house in the next week or two and say that you are a, a part of the Wiesenthal Mishpucha? Wow. And the man came and the door, his daughter was so happy, so said, you know, at least, wow, why didn't you tell me, Daddy, before that we have a family? He says, I wanted to wait till you'll get a little older. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way... He, he was. And you know, I'll tell you another story about him. People say, look, if you ask me, was Simon Wiesenthal a shul person? Did he go to Daven? The answer is, after the Holocaust, when he took that tremendous loss, he didn't. But he came from a religious background, going back generations. In 1946, he found himself in Switzerland. And there was the Vishnitzer Rebbe. And his grandfather was associated with Vishnitz. And so he, he went, he couldn't avoid going over to the Rebbe and saying that. So he didn't have a yarmulke. So he put his hand on his head, went over to the Vishnitzer Rebbe, and he said to the Vishnitzer Rebbe, Ich bin Shimon Wiesenthal, Simon Wiesenthal. And the Rebbe knew that this is Simon Wiesenthal somehow. So the Rebbe said, and he knew that what Wiesenthal, 1946, had taken upon himself the obligation to bring all these Nazi mur murderers to justice. So the vision to Rebbe told him like this, Shimon, Nemarunta, take out, take away the hand from your head. Let your maisim tovim, your good deeds, be your, yuma, be your yamaka. That's beautiful. Amazing. That is, it, it is beautiful because, you know, it's, it's funny that you pick that story because a lot of people, they do good deeds and people sometimes judge them. Did they go to temple? Do they go to shul? And you know what? The truth is there is a lot of people that don't necessarily go to shul, but they do so many maisim tovim that they should be recognized just as much as for going to shul as they are for the Masim Tovim. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're absolutely. And, you and, know, and that's what I loved reading in your book, uh, Abai Hayer. Um, throughout your whole book, you are not judgmental of anyone, uh, which made it so beautiful. You, you are very constant throughout the book that we should accept all people. It, it, and you are not even though you are talking about the Jewish Holocaust, in your book, you address so many other injustices in the world. Well, it's important to do that because if you only, we only speak about what happens to the Jews, mm -hmm. you're not part of the world. The Rabban Shalom created us to be in a world where not everybody is Jewish. But, you know, and, I, and, and the task is, you know, to be friendly with people, to encourage people to be, uh, to, have mice and tovim, good deeds, and you only chase them away if you start attacking them and saying, oh, this guy never goes to shul. She never does anything. What do we gain by that? Absolutely. And, and you know, we're supposed to attract, you know, uh, Lubavitch, they do, they, they're looking for Bali Tshuva. Lubavitch okay. people are looking for Bali Tshuva. 
if their attitude would be, oh, the guy, this guy doesn't wear a yarmulke, I'm never going to say hello to him. What is that going to do for us? Nothing. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Rabbi, I wanted to ask you yes. um, if you could share with us, how did um, Simon Wiesenthal feel when you told him you were going to name the center after him? If you can share that with us. And also before doing so, I just wanted to express my personal gratitude to you for having founded Eula Yeshiva, the Yeshiva in Los Angeles. I personally have two sons that attended Eula and a daughter that attended there and I'm a very big supporter of Eula. And uh, I thank you for being the driving force behind Eula. I don't think a lot of people perhaps know that. So I wanted to bring that out so that people are aware of that. Without Torah and without the, you know, at that time, there wasn't a vibrant uh, high school in Los Angeles, the second largest Jewish community in the country. Mm -hmm. I want you to know how I first had the idea to start to, to create in that building. And that, that was in 1970. Well, I have to tell you that Etty and I know everything because we read your book and we okay. studied you, but you, you have to let our book. listeners know. Because <laughs> as I would say you to see most all of the notes, all okay. the little notes. Yes. As I would say. <laughs> so, you know, so you know what happened. So what we happened? do know, but we need to let everyone know from your okay. words. <laughs> so here's what happened. I went to the, my, my uh, children and said, insisted that we go to the top pits. The Tar Pits in Los Angeles is a place that has underneath the ground, the excavation found dinosaurs. And uh, it's a very uh, well-known attraction here and many of you go there. And there mm -hmm. were a group, of, a group of young people and a girl asked well, one of the guides the following question. Can the dinosaurs come back in our, in our time? And the guide said, absolutely not, because of the dramatic changes in climate. It would be impossible for animals like dinosaurs to again come back on the planet Earth, given the now weather conditions here. So after that, my wife and I and the kids, we were walking home. And I said to myself, you know what? We just opened the Yeshiva High School. You over. And I said to myself, what if I ask that same question about the Holocaust? Can the Holocaust come back? Would I be able to answer no, because human beings have so much changed their way of thinking that it will never happen again? So I said to myself, you can't give that answer because it's not true. I and so I said, you know what? How about in the wing that we have not yet established in the new building, we start a Holocaust center, and who should we name it after, except for Simon Wiesenthal, the man who brought more than 1,100 Nazi war criminals to justice, found the person who arrested Anne Frank, the commandant of Treblinka, the commandant of Sobibor. And so I, we went there. And when we went there, you know, to ask, to ask for his name, I, I, I said basically, you know, I had met him one time, I took a group from when I was a rabbi in Vancouver and he was kind enough. So I took, we went there and uh, he immediately uh, basically said, look, he said, if you think that it will do good, but in order to do good, he said to me, I'll never forget. He, he, he had a very sloppy office and he gave me this message. Never, he said, in order to do good, you have to concentrate on that material all the time, 24 seven. And if you ever look, we have a recreation of Simon's office. He had a map on one side where all the labor and concentration camp and extermination camps were. Then he had his pipe. He would have candy that he would want every day. Nothing mattered. It was the sloppiest office I ever saw in my entire life. Never saw an office like that. And when he said, Rabbi Haya, you're looking at my desk, he says. My desk is not the important thing. The important thing is that map. See that map? All the concentration camps and the labor camps. Where are the criminals who murdered those Jews? My family and millions of others, he says. That's my focus. I don't care about my desk. And that's what he did. And he gave us his name. 
And uh, it was a, an amazing thing uh, to see about him. Uh, you know, he, anyone who knew him, he, uh, you know, he has the biggest honors from all kinds, from nations. If I don't want to say, if people, if people get an honor like that, we all put it in a prominent place. By him, it was in the drawer. It was not as it, it was not interested in it. He was only interested in one thing, getting those murderers. He says, and when he says, look, I also believe that there is an afterworld. And when he says that, that I don't have, I, I will not be able to say that I went to yeshiva. I will not be able to say that I can read the Torah by heart. I can't. But I will be able to say in Shemayim, he said, I never, I, he said, I never forgot what happened to our people. And every day of my life, I spent trying to bring those murderers to justice. He awesome. says, I think that will be enough. Right. Yeah. Um, he actually said that that will be his legacy. He said, I'm not going to take, if anything, I, I saw one of his quotes. He said, no matter what I do, this, this was my legacy. My legacy is um, the center in a way because people way after I'm gone are going to remember what happened. Um, so it was, Rabbi, um, and, the and world you know, is, go yeah, ahead. No, no, I was gonna say, he couldn't believe that he was actually world famous. Everybody, you know, he crossed the oceans. People knew about him because, so he couldn't believe when I told him at uh, one time, I, you know, I, I was had to tell him, I'll, I'll give you an example. In the uh, Esconi Center the, the, in San Francisco. So he was the mayor of San Francisco and he, he died, he was killed. And they named the uh, theater for him, a very large hall. And they wanted to make a memorial and they wanted um, basically, so they wanted Frank Sinatra to entertain. What they didn't know is that Frank Sinatra was a chassid of Simon Wiesenthal. And I'll tell you what happened with the story of Frank Sinatra and I'll finish it with the, what happened in the Moscone Center. One day, what we, we, were st we started, we put in the B'nai B'rith Messenger that we started this, we're starting the Simon Wiesdorf Center. My phone rings. I, I was in the yeshiva building there, but we, we were first finishing the final touches of the yeshiva. So there was no electricity and no wiring. I had a hundred foot extension, 100 to 150 <laughs> foot extension cord. Uh, the phone rings and I, the man on the phone I said, he says, are you Rabbi Haya? Did you place that ad in the B'nai B'rith Messenger that you're gonna start the Sam Wiesno Center? I said, yes. Are you gonna be in your office for the next two hours? I said, who is this? He says, Mickey Rudin. I said, <laughs> Rudin. I said, who are you? I mean, no, Mr. Rudin, I don't know. He said, I'm Frank Sinatra's lawyer. <laughs> you're gonna get a call from Frank Sinatra within the next two hours. So I said, Frank Sinatra? <laughs> you I probably said, thought it was a prank why, call. <laughs> no, yeah, why, why, why is he calling me, he says. You know why he's calling you? Because he doesn't listen to his lawyer. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he called, he, he, uh, about an hour and a half goes by and the phone rings. And it's Frank Sinatra. This is Rabbi. You're the one. Did you pinch yourself in that moment? No, no. You, <laughs> Rabbi, you're the one who put that ad uh, in the, the story in the <clears throat> Ben Averett's Messenger. I said, yes, we're building the side of Wiesel. He says, <clears throat> I'd like to invite you to my house oh my God. Sunday in Palm Springs. You can bring your wife. Can you come down? I said, Frank, I said, Mr. Sinatra, what? Why? Because I'm going to help you. Come on to my house. So on Sunday, my wife and I drive down, and his wife, Barbara Sinatra, opens the door. 
sits us down. He had fruit. Nothing was unkosher. He had for us fruit and nuts. And as soon as we sit down, he says to his lawyer, <clears throat> Mickey Rudin, get me, uh, Mickey, bring in our, uh, our neighbor, Danny Schwartz. Bring it, tell him, tell him we're all ready to go now. Tell him to come in now. Danny Schwartz comes in and he says, <clears throat> Danny, you and I are going to make sure that the Simon Wiesenthal Center gets started. Wow. <clears throat> Who do you know in business that we can make a call? He says, Don Sofa. We did business with him last month. And he calls up Don so Frank Sinatra calls him up, says, hello, Don. He says, it's Frank Sinatra. And so you can see on the other line, I was there. The guy was like shocked. And he says, listen, uh, Don, I'm sending my rabbi down next week or so. I sure hope you're going to give a nice donation. We're starting the Simon Wiesendahl Center. I, the next week, I come down to Florida. I'm afraid that the guy's going to yell at me that this was a setup. As soon as I come in, Don Sofa says, <clears throat> Rabbi, ah, this was a wonderful week. He said, first of all, here's your check, $100,000. Wow. And he says, <clears throat> this is the best business week I've ever had. I've been on the golf course every single day. And I'm telling people, guess who called me to, to get me to give money to a Jewish cause? He says, Frank Sinatra. And, uh, and Frank Sinatra became a member of the board of Louise and Center. He introduced us to everybody in the entertainment community. Wow. Why? Because he had the greatest respect for Simon Wiesenthal. Amazing. Those Nazi criminals to justice. Wow. And all his year, he, he, he was a chassid of his, and until he died, he was a member of the Board of Trustees of the Wiesendorf Center. Amazing. That's all of Hollywood. Call a kabod. It's amazing. And this is all in the book, by the way. It's all recounted I'm, in the book. Yes. I'm, I'm going to have all my kids read that book. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's history, book, with a lot of humor in it and a lot of great stories. <laughs> Rabbi, the world is seeing one of the highest rises. Go ahead. No, no, no. Yeah, oh. but what happened there? Go ahead. Rabbi, um, the world is seeing one of the highest rises in anti-Semitism. Throughout history, Jews were the scapegoats for anything negative in the world. Just recently, um, when, um, we had COVID, we still have COVID, but when COVID started, uh, flyers were passed in Beverly Hills and around the city, blaming the Jews for COVID. On the other hand, in 2020, Israel signed agreements establishing diplomatic relations with um, four Arab League countries, Iran, United Arab Emirates, Sudan and Morocco, in addition to Egypt and Jordan. So you see, on one hand, you see anti-Semitism going up, on the other end, you see Arab countries that are starting diplomatic relations with Israel. Um, inflation is rising right now. Um, there is a war going on. Uh, Iran is a real threat to Israel, and I think for the rest of the world. How concerned are you uh, about another Holocaust? Very concerned. <clears throat> and let me, let me tell you why. We have to learn from history. We know like this. Adolf Hitler took power in 1933. We have the original Hitler letter where Hitler wrote on September the 16th, 1919, he writes a letter after World War I that he says, the final objective must be the total removal of the Jews altogether. That's what he wrote when he was early on at the end of World War I, what the world waited and waited and waited. And then in the end, the Jewish people, one third of world Jewry was wiped out. Now the same thing, God forbid, I don't want to say the same thing, but we're headed in the same direction oh, with know. Iran. Mm -hmm. We know that Iran denies the Holocaust. The Iranian leaders say it never happened. It was a complete lie. 
Right. And the world continues. Now they are developing nuclear weapons. We know from, in fact, when Bibi Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu at the United Nations held up the document. Uh -huh. Look, and the document showed that they lied. They made a deal with the West that they wouldn't do these things. And they were doing these things. Now we know for sure that you cannot rely on them whatsoever. Okay. And still the Western powers, we want to make a deal with Iran. But how can you make a deal with a, a country that denies the Holocaust and that lies? And if you're going to make a deal, you have to make it so costly for them rather than again, trust them. So we know what happened under Netanyahu when he wrote, when he read that letter in, in front of the entire United Nations. And here we are again, and President Biden and the other Western leaders, they want to make a deal with Iran. That will be on Israel's back. Because we, now people say, well, what are we going to do? Well, what do you mean, what are you going to do? You, you have to tell the Iranians as well, if you want to make a deal, we have to be that 100% certain of what you're doing on the ground. We have to, you have to have people, if you want to make a deal with Iran, you have to have people working in that lab, seeing what the other people are doing that are representing other countries instead of trusting Iran. That's our mistake. We forget Hitler wrote that letter in 1919. He was elected in 1933. But so we knew who Hitler was. We knew what he was going to do. And um, we waited from 1933. We went to the Olympics, the 36 Olympics. The United States sent a full team there. As a matter of fact, the person that was the head of the delegation later went into construction. He wanted to build the German embassy in Washington, D.C. as a payoff. So we history, we trust criminals. Fine. And when you do that, you pay the price. You can't trust the Aitola. If the Aitola would say, I'm sorry, I've investigated the Holocaust. I was mistaken. It actually happened. I'm embarrassed. That would be a different story. But you know, that he retains his commitment that it never happened. And we treat him like a fellow partner. Yeah. You know what's sad is that if it was with any other people, the world would not, because think about it, he's denying the Holocaust. Yeah. And people are sitting and, you know, we, we are going to make a deal with him, but if he denied anything else, nobody will, it, it, it's, it's sad and it's, it, it worries me. I actually lose sleep over it yeah. because, you know, Jewish blood and Jewish, you know, we were only always the underdog. Like we, it's okay if the you know Iran is going to deny the Holocaust. It's okay if they denied everything, anything else, it wouldn't be okay. And the funniest thing is, and it's really sad for me, that you sit and in the UN you see them blaming Israel for war crimes. Israel, out of all the countries, for war crimes, and you see everything that's going on in the world, and you see everything that's going on in Iran and so many other places in the world. And everybody's silent about this, but the UN, Israel is on, always at the head of the agenda about <laughs> yeah. it's, no, it's- it, it, Absolutely. And you know something, all the anti-Semites, though, you know, you take a person like Louis Farrakhan, a vicious right. anti-Semite. He's had numerous operations. Most of the operations that he has had, the, the invention, of the procedure for those operations were committed by Jews. The Jews are the ones who found he was operated. And instead of saying, who, who, who made this possible? Ayid made this possible. What am I, what am I having a machlokas with Jews uh -huh. when they've done this? Did, did the Jews play a role in COVID, in helping the cure to COVID? Of course they played a role. They, 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 they discovered they, 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 the chairman of, for example, of Pfizer is a, is a Jew who basically had a role in helping the world solve the, the, the recent crisis. So instead of saying thank you, the anti-Semites say, how can we start up with them again? 
Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, Rabbi, um, we are going to shift gears a little bit right now. And uh, we wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about the inauguration. <laughs> um, what an incredibly proud moment it was for every Jew to see you give a prayer at the inauguration of President Donald Trump. We want you to share with us, Yentas, what it was like to be called by the inauguration committee to give the prayer, what transpired thereafter. You know, we're Yentas, we want details. <laughs> Did you meet with the president? You get kosher, uh, did, kosher lunch. You know, did you have, yeah, did you have a luncheon after that? Um, you know, we want you to take us back to the events that led up to that historic moment. After okay. all, we are Yentes. You know, the Yentes need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. It, it was, uh, I never would have believed, I, I felt terrible that neither one of uh, my parents were alive to witness that. Uh, I, I uh, you know, we got a call from the White House that the president uh, wanted me to give the invocation. Um, so I was, of course, very grateful. And, uh, it, it, they, you know, uh, humbled by it. And here's what happened. Yeah, we want to know. <laughs> I give you the detail. So Cardinal Dolan, he, you know, the Cardinal, there were three clergy on the Cardinal Dolan. Now, what they did, we had to arrive very early. We left the hotel that morning. We arrived the day before. The Secret Service provided areas that we, in, in which hotel, and they, they, they uh, policed that uh, hotel where the people were who had to participate. And here's what happened. We had to come there at 7.30 a.m. in the morning. So we arrived, first of all, we had a rehearsal beforehand. Not, there was a rehearsal the day before. And uh, in the rehearsal, they don't, you, don't, you don't read the text. What you do is just see that the microphone works and how far you're going to be from the microphone, where the president is going to be, where the other presidents are going to be, the former presidents, etc. And then, so at 7.30, we arrive under escort. And they make sure that you have to go through that you're not carrying anything, et cetera, just like any other person. Now, it starts raining. So Cardinal Dolan, the Cardinal of New York, he comes over to me, a very nice person. And he says out loud in front of all the people, uh, the rabbi here is in charge of the rain. It's up to him to make it stop. So, uh, it, you know, a half an hour goes by. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. So this was 7.30. So this was 10.30. So uh, 10, we, we were there and we, you know, when you're there, they put you, they make, make sure you're in your seat. They don't let other people come nearby. And uh, we schmooze together. And uh, anyway, when it stopped, I went over to the Cardinal. I said, uh, Cardinal, I said, uh, Am I still in charge? The cardinal says, oh no, when it stops raining, I'm in charge. I say, is that the way you want to, uh, anyway. So that's what happened in, in the, you know, now came the, you know, on the time of the invocation. Um, before, a day or two before, I had asked the White House for permission that I wanted to put into the tefillah, Imesh Kachei Yerushalayim, Tishkachi Mini, if I forget the O oh, Jerusalem, may my right hand lose, uh, lose its cunning. And so I, I fit it into the other quote that I had, and then I moved that quote right in there. So the person that reviewed it said, Rabbi, why do you want to put it in? And I said to myself, why? Because every country in the world has a recognized capital, except the Jewish people. Uh, we have no capital. I know, and there, there's no capital to recognize. They say Tel Aviv, it's Haifa, there's also West Jerusalem, but there's no capital. So I put it into the tefillah, see what happens. And to my surprise, they saw it, they called it back, and they said, everyone's happy with it. Go right ahead, Rabbi. And uh -huh. so when I said the tefillah, Meshkachech Yerushalayim, 
uh, I, I got a lot of criticism from people on the conservative reform. Why are you going, you know, and uh, represented, you know, with President Trump? But I'll tell you one thing that I believe in because it's in the Gemara. Yesh kona lomo b'shoachas. You can be kona your world in the world to come in one hour. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about so many presidents, and and you know there are no cap. It, does Israel have a capital? No. Mm -hmm. You know where Tel Aviv is, Haifa, no capital. President Trump, that's one thing, whether you like him, whether you like how he behaved on January 6th. Yes, word. Not, yeah. But this thing cannot be taken that of all the presidents, he is he he delivered the fact to recognize Jerusalem, said the Jewish people, the state of Israel, has a right to have a capital. Like every other nation in the world, the name of the capital is Jerusalem, where the embassy is now going up. And when the new embassy is up, it'll be finished. Uh, then we, are the, everyone will know that America's, America's ambassador, no matter who is the president, America's ambassador in the state of Israel sits every day in its in eternal America. capital, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Amazing. He was the only one who kept his word. A lot That's of right. presidents said they'll, they'll do it. Nobody did it. And he kept his word. That's and right. I, know I have a lot of respect for you, Rabbi Heyer, because I know that there was a lot of pressure on you when you accepted um, the committee's uh, request to come to the White House for the inauguration. And you know what? That's what makes a great leader. Because a great leader doesn't have to agree with people you have to accept all people. And I think, and you you know, a lot of the criticism came actually from the Jewish people for you to go to the inauguration. And you know what? I think what you did was the smartest thing for the Jewish people because, you know, can you imagine a president, regardless if you agree with his politics, you don't agree with it, you're invited to come to the White House as a rabbi. And you said, no, 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 I don't wanna come because I just don't agree with this. And yeah. you know what? It took a lot of courage from you because I know, I remember when it happened, I saw all the news and you know, that makes you such a great leader because a great leader does not cave to pressure and you didn't, you went with your truth. Well, listen, first of all, prayers, and especially pr I, I believe that uh, every reform, conservative, Reconstructionist, agnostic, who believes that every country has a capital and the state of Israel deserves to have a capital city. Manishtana, why should Israel, all that does is give in to the bigots and anti Semites who said, no, everybody can have what they want, but for the right. Jews, they don't have that. We deserve a capital, we pay the price. The 3,500 years in exile, the Tsaurus that we've had, if there's any country in the world that deserves a capital, and if there's any country in the world that basically, uh, you know, yearned for Jerusalem for so many years. And, and so when President Trump uh, later on declared that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, he did the right thing. Now, if you ask me, do I agree with everything that any president does? I, there were things that I differ with every single president that would include Donald Trump. But right. Jerusalem was returned back as the capital city of the eternal capital of Israel by Donald Trump. And he deserves the credit, credit. for having oh, made so that great. Yeah. Yeah, he deserves Absolutely. credit. You know, Rabbi, I wanted to ask you how much anti-Semitic, uh, how much anti-Semitic communication did you receive at the center after the inauguration of Trump, and in general? Well, in general, we always get, but uh, we got some letters and uh, telephone calls from people. Yeah, I'm sure. We how to answer it? We said as follows: Listen, what what do you want to do during the Holocaust? How many people? How many people were killed? by the Germans. Does Germany have a capital? It has a capital. And only the Jewish people should be singled out from the entire world with no capital. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. And there's nowhere for them to go, except to say, we don't have a good answer. 
All right. All right. So before Etty asks you the next question, did you get to actually spend some time with uh, President Trump after the inauguration? Yes. Well, first of all, I was invited to give another, uh, you know, uh, invocation where the president was there. And so, yes, I'm, I met with him and I also met with him a second time when there were people from all over the world that were invited. I also gave the prayer then. And I quoted Rabbi Soloveitchik in the and during that quote during. And you went to the embassy when they opened the embassy to Israel. Yes, I was there, and uh, yeah, and I had also the privilege of lighting the flame. The yeah. Flame. Yes. Oh, yeah. You mentioned in the, uh, the first yeah. American to be. Uh, you know, yeah. I, told, I told over the story of my Zeta. You know, I you may it may be in the book. It's in the book. So <clears throat> my Zeta was rubbed in Neil Frost. It was a Belzer Chosid. And one day when I was in uh, learning at RJJ, Yankov Yosef in the Lower East Side, he says to me, I have to come with him uh, to pick up an esrig in Canal Street, an esrig in Lulu. Right. And it starts. Yeah, and, I, and I really, by the way, I just want to interject. I loved your business that you had going on as a teenager. Hi. You were very <laughs> entrepreneurial. I, you know, kudos to you. You made the big bucks as, you know. <laughs> You know, you know why she loved it so much? One of her sons is exactly like that. One of my favorite son. <laughs> so, so anyway, what happened was I go with my Zeta. I was then about, uh, I'd say, 12, 12 years old and, and on Canal Street. And it's raining. And my Zeta, he, he, he takes the asterisk, opens the box of the asterisk, and start smelling it. And so I said to him, Zaydi, I said, why are you doing this? Why, why are you doing this? You know, it's ra it's raining here. And uh, it, we, we'll do, do it when we get at our home. It'll be it'll be dry. It's not even sukkahs yet. So what, what do we, so he says, Moshe says, let me tell you why I'm doing this. He says, this Esrik was put in the box from Eretz Yisrael. Now, it, I will never have, I'm too old, I'll never have the privilege of ever going to Eretz Yisrael. The reason I want to smell it, I don't want to wait until the smell goes out by itself. I want to smell the air of Eretz Yisrael. Oh, so sad. It's so, oh wow. Oh, I want to cry. <laughs> wow. Rabbi Heyer, the Jewish community of, of uh, Serbia and Northern Greece, including the 50,000 Jews uh, of Salonika, fell under direct German occupation in April uh, 1941 and oh, bore the full weight um, and the same intensity of the Nazi repressive, uh, repressive measures from uh, dispossession, humiliation, and forced labor to hostage taking, and finally deportation and extermination in March to August of 1943. During the Nazi occupation of Yugoslavia and Greece, most of the Sephardim were deported uh, to concentration camps, where the majority of those perished. Yet when we discuss the Holocaust, the Sephardic, for some reason, everybody is under the impression that it was only Ashkenazic Jews. And there were a lot of Sephardic Jews, uh, but we they're barely brought up when we discuss the Holocaust. And a lot of our younger generation, our generation knows about it, you know, but our younger generation um, does not even know that there were Sephardics that were murdered in the Holocaust. Um, how can we bring a little bit more awareness to the Sephardic Jews that perished so in so we can honor them as well absolutely look uh, we have many survivors most of them as you say came from europe and but it, it's they they the the svardim were left high and dry it's a terrible thing because people think that they didn't suffer they did you know when the, when the nazis uh, came and uh, took them from Greece and other places. They took them right to the same camps that all the Polish Jews and, and Hungarian Jews suffered. It's an it's an oversight. It should be corrected, and it'll be it's corrected in the walls in the uh, here in the Sam Wisnow Center 
where we indicate how much was lost by the Sephardic Jews. And we also have, uh, you know, the amongst the people who speak about the Holocaust, we have Sephardic Jews that speak here regularly about oh, what that's happened in the Shoah. And we've had events, we sponsored events where Sephardic Jews were the uh, were the reason for that public event in our theater, where they tell what happened to them in Greece and in other areas. Mm-hmm. There's no reason to leave, you know, to, 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 to say that only Ashkenazim suffered is simply not true. It's a lie and mm-hmm. they can be corrected. So and I have to say- I have, I have Greek background, so my family knows about it. And it's really funny because when you say, oh, we lost people in the Holocaust, they go, but you're Sephardic, you're half Sephardic. <laughs> Yeah, you know, somebody People are so shocked, you know. <laughs> well, we know that that uh, when Hitler, that he, Hitler, Hitler Machimo, did not Machimo, discriminate. He, he, right, he did. discriminate by him. Jews were Jews. Jews, right? No, but actually, um, I, we, the, he, same, the same today with the Aitola. This no. is our problem today that the world doesn't see. They think that the the idea of a Hitler has disappeared from the planet. Totally wrong. Don't right. Yeah, Etty and I have been to the museum a few times, but the last time we were there, she actually, you know, in one of the rooms, the virtual rooms where you get a passport and they give you a, a child. So Etty actually got a child from Salonika. Right. It was really funny because that was one of my questions. <laughs> and we decided to go visit the museum. We've been there many times and we took children, you know, all our children there. But we decided that since we're going to interview you, we should go see the center again. And it was funny because I got a child from Salonika. Well, you know, with that, I'll tell you, you, you saw that, I think I mentioned this in my book. I, I had a Rebbe in, in, very young, uh, when I was a young kid, uh, just before, you know, before the bar mitzvahs, et cetera. Uh, anyway, and he was a Bianca Laflanskaram. He was a Satma Chosset. Can you imagine? He was a Satma Chosset. Wow. On the side, he taught bar mitzvahs. Wow. A long beard, long pace. And I'll never forget, it was from him that I got the first yearning that I should not go into business when I grow older, but should do something in the Jewish community. Because Rabbi Ankel Franzka, this is what he told me. My mother, Razel Frost, who married my father, so became Razel Hyatt. She took me to Rabbi Ankel of Flansky, knocked on the door of a storefront on the Lower East Side. When he was not the yeshiva, he was teaching bar mitzvahs in a storefront. And she said to him, please, learn mit ma'azin, teach my son the, for his bar mitzvah. And of course, you know, he got, he got paid for what he did. So Rabbi Ankel, he kept, I kept going there for the bar mitzvah said. And he would always pinch my my. my cheek. Oh. He'd say like this. Hecha, zug hecha. Say the say the brachas hecha, louder, louder. Yeah. So I said to him one day, I said, Rebbe, why should I say it louder? I, I, it's not my bar mitzvah yet. Why should I say it louder? <laughs> no, no, no. He says, I'm I'm training you for your bar mitzvah. And you know why I want you to say hecha at the top of your voice? He says, you're saying the Torah for the millions of Jews who died in the Shoah, who never had a bar mitzvah. Oh, I, I, wow. want, you to be, wow. I want you to be mozi them. Wow. Wow. That's wow. very deep. Wow, wow. Very, very deep. Wow. You know, my daughter was a part of the ISC and then uh, a Tanim, I don't know if you heard about the program, it's, uh, they teach them high tech and how to bring technology and to promote Israel, kind of act IL. And she came out with a program where you pick a Holocaust, somebody in the Holocaust, in the same age, she created a program that they match you. So let's say you are, I'm 50. The system picks somebody that was my age with the same amount of kids, same marital status, everything. And you go through their life at your age. So you actually know what they felt 
at your age. And she won, it, actually she took it to APAC and right. she presented it and she won for that, uh, to do that, like that right. uh, program. And by the way, I'll tell you one other thing that you, uh, your listeners, I, I do. This is uh, a, something from uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik. It says like this, that it says in the Torah, Vayikach Terach es Avram Bino, and Terach took Avram, his son, to Eretz Canaan. So Rav Soloveitchik says like this, who was Terach? Terach in the beginning was an, a no good Nick. He says, but in the end, he changed his mind and deserves the credit for introducing the Jewish people to their eternal homeland in Eretz Canaan. Vayikach Terach. Terach took Avram Beno. He took Avram Beno away from the rest of the world and said, no, you, you are the first Jew. You are going to, you need to go to the journey to Eretz Canaan, which is your eternal homeland. And so he says, so from this you learn as follows. Jews need help. We can't do it alone. We need good people of other faiths and religions. Lots of friends. To help the Jewish people. We've suffered enough throughout our history. Wow. One Holocaust, some pogroms, the Holocaust. And if we wouldn't have people in the United States Senate in the United States Congress, Absolutely. people around the world who mm -hmm. are prepared to say, you know what? We are proud to be defenders of the Jewish people and the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. I'm Yisrael Chai. Hi. I'm Yisrael Chai. Why don't you make me right. cry when you say I that? I know. <laughs> well, Rabbi, I, you know, I don't know if you know, because we're, if your headspace is there, but uh, the Oscars is coming up. <laughs> it's coming up i think it's this sunday or in a few sundays from now and uh you know uh, for our viewers we are speaking to a two-time oscar winner here do you happen to have him in your office there well yes i do oh well show us these yentas want to see no we can't take it out but we can oh, oh. you can see it oh okay i'll tell you yeah go ahead so go ahead yeah <laughs> we gotta oh, see Oscar. Wow. wow. Oh, I see him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is. Wow. <laughs> so that's incredible. I'll, I'll tell you a story. When I won the Academy Award first, so uh, we went backstage, and there we met uh, Jack Lemon and another person, and they see. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a yarmulke and I'm coming with my Oscar. And he's, he says to the people, he says, you see what happens? Things have changed in the world. If you want to win an Academy Award, you got to go to a good yeshiva. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, so I want, to, I want to know, that's very funny. I want to know what it meant to you and Mariah Films to win an Oscar. And I wanted to know if you could share with our viewers some of your upcoming projects that you're working on. I think you're working on something with George Clooney, I think. Yes. And Amal working. Clooney. We're working on the, no, we, 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 we're going to have a film on Paris. It will appear uh, in Netflix around the world. And now we're working on a finishing a, a documentary on David Ben-Gurion. Oh, wow. And this will tell the story. We have some wonderful, I can't say it now because we, when it'll come out, but uh, amazing stories about the youth when he was just a kid, the ages of six, 10, 13. It'll all come in that film. Uh, culminating, of course, in the crea in the declaration, the creation of the state of Israel. Wow, so, uh, incredible. But, you know, look, there, there are many people. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I want you to know all the people who narrate our films in Hollywood, mm -hmm. never, not one penny. They, they, it's all, they narrate it. 
uh, because they want they want to they do it for free. It's fabulous. Wow. The tradition fabulous. Started, long tradition started by Frank Sinatra. He was mm -hmm. not a narrator, but he made sure that that was the that was the way to start it. Well, you had some really big hitters with Elizabeth Taylor and Orson Welles in, in your documentary. Well, you read in the book, Elizabeth Taylor. Yes. <laughs> I, I took her to the wrong studio and, uh, <laughs> and she was pretty upset because I didn't know England. We recorded in England. I don't know my way around. I relied on a taxi driver and he schlepped us to the wrong studio. And I thought, oh, ve is mere. That's finished with the narration, uh -huh. and that's it. And uh, so fortunate for me, I had gone to a, a Blums at that time. This go, this is 19, 1981, 1981 or nineteen eighty, Blums uh, delicatessen in London, where I bought myself because you have to have kosher foods. For, you know what I was eating, so I bought two big. Um, corned beef sandwiches, huge, like this. Each one was like this, because I figured I'll have to eat it in the morning. Who knows how long <laughs> I have to stay right. in and let it at night. So when I told her that I brought it to the wrong studio and she was pretty upset, I thought, finished. All of a sudden she says, where's that delicious smell coming from? <laughs> and I said, Elizabeth, <laughs> this is my... Um, this is my, I bought, you know, I only eat kosher and I bought my things. She says, aren't you going to share it? <laughs> and I gave her the club sandwich. She was very happy, happy. Went in the right studio and recorded a wonderful thing <laughs> that, won, that eventually won the Academy Award. Yeah. And Rabbi Heyer didn't have dinner. No. <laughs> oh. Rabbi, before we close out, what is your message to our viewer? And also, what is it, in your opinion, the steps that need to be taken to teach the next generation about the Holocaust, given that they are the first that won't have a living survivor during their lifetime? Well, my suggestion would be, look, I'm Yisrael, the Jewish people. We need people that look after what's happened not everybody, I'm not, I have no tinnitus. The people go into business, they go into professional careers, but always make time, you know, for Am Yisrael. Never lock yourself away and say, I'm only interested in things for my family. Use your, the limited time that we have here on the planet, each one of us, you know, I'm, whether it's going to be 40, 50, younger, no matter how much, we don't, we don't live here forever. And while we're here, do what you can to fulfill the Rabboni Shalom that the Rabboni Shalom said for Am Yisrael. The Jewish people will return to their eternal homeland and they'll not only be, the Jew, we want Jews to live around the world, but Klal Yisrael, after all its suffering all the years, deserves to be in the United Nations as a country, a country that will live on forever, ad bias goel tzedek, and a country that has looked, take, taken care of Hitler. Hitler is no longer here. Stalin is no longer here. The Iranian Ayatollah will not be here forever. Yeah. <laughs> if the Ayatollah reads history and reads any book, it will say like this. We may not be a law around here, but Am Yisrael is here forever. Right, absolutely. Amen. 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 So, funny, so Rabbi Heyer, you know what? You know why Karen and I started Yentas in the City, is especially when um, we, Trump was running for office, we saw that there was a large division among the Jews, you know, especially politically. And we studied a little bit before because we saw that there was such a division. And we said, you know what, Karen, you have your career. She's a psychologist. I work in entertainment. I'm actually, we do brand licensing for many, many years. And I said, you know what, let's do something for the community. And we thought we're just starting something and we are going to see it from an orthodox and a non-orthodox lenses. And before we knew it, we had all these amazing people that wanted to come on the show and discuss just like this, this is this is by far the most emotional interview we had, <laughs> but it was amazing. And you know what, when you do for the community and you do things for our people, there is no past time 
to it. I actually told that Ken, I said, Ken, I wish we made enough money where we can actually quit our job and just give to the community. <laughs> That's how much <laughs> we love doing this, you know? <laughs> Keep doing it. Yes. Thank you. Jewish people deserve to laugh. We yes. We spend too much time crying. No. <laughs> <laughs> or eating. <laughs> no, but Rabbi, it's been amazing having you here. Etty's going to close us out, but I want to sneak in one tiny, quick little question. The last, last, last question. It's a Jewish you, question, you yeah, know? No, well, you've been married to Malki for almost 60 years. How you met in the book, I literally was crying. It was so beautiful, the story of how you met in the country club. You're playing ping pong with her sister and she set you up. It was such a beautiful story, really. And you know how you left your families and they were crying to go to Canada, I, just very touching. But I wanted to ask you, what it, do you attribute to being the key to a successful marriage? Besides saying, yes, honey. <laughs> well, the, the, the key to a successful marriage is to recognize you're not gonna win every time. If you recognize the fact that, listen, you have a point of view, but your wife has another point of view, and in many areas, women, wives are more clever than their husbands. So if we don't listen to the wives, we get in trouble. <laughs> but my wife on the side liked to nosh. I was at that time a bus boy. And I said, listen, if I like that lady, I better, sir, I better de deliver the goods. And so, uh, you know, Baruch Hashem, uh, I'm very proud of my wife and her accomplishments. And I couldn't have done what I did if I didn't marry her. So she can tell me every time, you're wrong, do it this way. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, thank you, Rabbi Heyer. It's really been an honor to have thank you with us. Thank you. Thank you so my much, pleasure. Rabbi Heyer, for joining us today. Your life's dedication to the center and to the remembrance and honor of the 6 million Jews that were perished and murdered in the Holocaust leaves us really speechless. In your book, you said that your father's favorite saying from the Talmud was, you're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. That's correct. This should, be, uh, should remind each of us, especially parents and educators, that each person has an obligation to do good work in his or her generation and to plant seeds to affect future generation. And you have done just that, and we thank you for it. Your center is um, reminds all of future is here to remind all future generation um, of the horror of the Holocaust and make sure that never again really is never again. Thank you again so much for taking time out of your very very busy schedule to speak to us today, and we can't wait to take you out to dinner. We are not going to take no for an answer. Uh, we don't take like thank <laughs> all our followers and um, for listening to this episode. Please remember you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Yentas in the City. You should also write us at dearyentas at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you and answer um, your letters on our weekly advice column. We would like to thank our sponsors, Soft Smart Systems International and Conquest Realty Investment. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We have a lot more coming. This is Etty Elkis and Karen Coyne, and we are Yentas in the City. Today, I would like to end this episode with a very famous quote by Simon Wiesenthal. You're a religious man. You believe in God and life after death. I also believe. When we come to the other world and meet the millions of Jews who died in the camps, and they ask us, what have you done? There will be many answers. You will say, I became a jeweler. Another will say, I smuggled coffee and American cigarettes. Another will say, I built houses. But I will say, I didn't forget you. Never again, Simon Wiesenthal. Remember to always be the Ruth in the room and do the right thing. Stay safe and thank you for being with us. Rabbi Haya, thank you so much. Thank Please you. stay with us a few minutes after. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.